founder of Chicago for Abortion Rights. And I'm so is a network of abortion activists from organizations all over the city fighting. Um, all eyes have been on Iran's aid and much longer. The Arabs in bodily autonomy, inspiring women and feminists around the world, especially here in Chicago and in the United States. We here in the U.S. live in a country that is increasingly taking away women's rights and threatening our bodily autonomy, which only highlights the hypocrisy of the U.S. government holding itself up as a shining example of democracy. Activists in the United States have much to learn from the radical feminists, both in Latin America, who took to the streets day after day to win the right to a safe and legal abortion, as well as the people in the streets in Iran fighting for self-determination and the right to control their lives free of outside intervention, and that includes from the United States. And with that, I'll let the panelists take it from here. We'll hear from each of our three panelists in turn, and then there will be a chance for discussion at the end. So if you have any questions at all, please feel free to drop them in the chat at any time. And our first speaker today, I'm so honored to introduce Roya Karbash, an Iranian-born artist. Her work reflects the inner strength of women as captured through their eyes. As an observer and critic, her detailed works illuminate the feelings of oppression and the desire for the collapse of the traditional ways of life that are demanded in Iran. Roya's paintings portray women from different levels of existence and are brought together in scenes that seem to take place outside of the normal perceptions of time. Her focus on the eyes show the spiritual power and the indomitable spirit that resides within the soul of women. Karbash works as a freelance artist and art teacher in Chicago and surrounding suburbs. And just a note, Roya will have to leave this event a little early today, but we're so, so grateful that she could take the time to join us. And I'll turn it over to you, Roya. Thank you so much, Mandy. Thank you for having us today. Uh, I would like to be here and answer any questions. Um, Roy, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you got started in your artistic practice? Uh, so I got my master's degree in Iran and uh, came here like five years ago and I start uh, to be active artists here too. As I was an artist in Iran, I wasn't able to show <laughs> exactly my artist side as a like, uh, I mean, be a voice of woman over there. So when I came here, uh, it, was, it was a good opportunity for me to talk loudly about the women, especially women from Middle East. I mean, that my painting is not especially about the women in Iran. I'm, I try to talk about all women around the world. So I uh, came here and uh, right now I'm trying to show all the situation that women struggle with that uh, in my painting and show them and talk to my paintings. Um, and the current struggle in Iran, how has that uh, affected your art or inspired your art? Can you tell us a little more about that? Yes, so as you can know, uh, Iranian regime uh, kind of used men to be against the women, like telling them, uh, like <laughs> they're all saying them to every day, you own your sister, you own your mother, you own your daughter, you own your wife. So women in Iran, they are not able to travel to another country. They are not without uh, why I mean husband or um, uh, father's permission and we are not allowed to sing we are not allowed to ride a bicycle in a street we are not allowed to dance and we are not allowed to go to a studio so um, this revolution lead with the woman and next to them you can see the men support them and start to support them this is a beautiful thing that happened in Iran and um, is exactly the the real face of Iran that everybody would love to see it. But I try to kind of show this one in my painting and uh, especially the last one, and uh, and kind of show how women are brave and how they are worried about what they want and they're fighting for that. And I support them and I try to kind of. Uh, um, I try my best to be a day voice. So hopefully it's going to go show through my paintings to everybody. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Roya. We have a question um, from Nancy. Um, she says that she understands that when you were in Iran, you were picked up by the morality police. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh. So, yeah, I think every girls over there, they arrested because of just uh, showing the little hair. So I was in the capital, same too. I was in my city. So it wasn't about my hair, showing my hair. It was just about I uh, wearing uh, long boots. And they arrested me, and the, my fam my family wasn't there, and it, I was so sad, and I was scared, and I wasn't sure where they are gonna took me. And they arrested us in a van, and they took us to the uh, I don't know, it was like the office, and they uh, got all IDs and talk about why you are wearing like that, why you are, what do you think this is Islamic country? I said, oh, I, I, my hair isn't. <laughs> is not even show uh, what what uh, what's the problem about my like uh, hijab and they say oh okay maybe you are not showing your hair but you show you wear the long boots and i said oh this is not i'm not allowed to wear long shoes and they said no so it, it was that time it was so scary for me because i wasn't sure what i did and why I have to arrest it because of like something very, very like simple things. And why I have to be cry, I mean, cried over there. And a lot of girls start to cry and I'm begging them, leave the, us alone. We, and they said, no, you have to, your parents going to have to come here and um, bring a chado or something like hijab for you. We are we not going to let you to go. And a lot of bad words they saying to us. So I don't think so any woman around the world should treat like that. We are not deserved to have a, like this, you know, situation. Just as a like a regular woman, we are going to the street and then I said because of like little things, wearing the long boots or showing the little of the hair or even your clothes, that's not fair at all. Wow. Um, in light of, you know, the morality police supposedly being shut down and in the news, I, that's just an extremely powerful story. I'm sorry you had to go through that. Um, I wonder if you would talk a little bit more about the role of art um, and activism and in this struggle more broadly, not just yours, but um, other artists you may be inspired by or art that you've seen in Iran. Um, what role do you think that plays in the struggle? Um. Art has a duty. One of the duty is just inform people around the world um, what's going on. Can be like about talking about the people situation. Can talk about um, uh, in a different story. So one of the duty of art is talking loudly and show everybody around the world um, how people struggle uh in a like a kind of situ situation, especially like a woman in Iran or even. They are killing and excuse uh, people right away after they are protesting the street. So you can see um, right now here, or even in Iran, I have some friends. They start to paint their sadness or their feeling um, through this situation, and they try to show it with uh, their art. And also here, I can see a lot of artists that start to work and show everybody um, they feeling and they fear about this uh, situation. So art can be very helpful. Um, so this is the kind of like art can do that. I agree. And thank you so much for sharing yours with us. Uh, Mashid and Zora, if you have questions too, feel free to hop in. But I did want to know, uh, Roya, where can we find your art here? I know you had an opening recently, but where can where can we see more of your art? Yeah, I have a um, exhibition right now, the Woman Life Freedom, uh, in a, a gallery A plus C gallery in a Skokie, and uh, it's gonna be a uh, um, the last uh, for one uh, month over there. So if somebody interesting to go there and see the works, is available, and you will come to go to this gallery and see the works. And it's not just my works over there, it's also 
you can find the beautiful paintings from artists they are who they are not here they are still in Iran so then they are very great artists and they talk really loudly about women too I have a question uh, are you going to post a, a flyer or anything about your exhibition in the scope uh, Oh, we did actually. It was a uh, last week. It was the opening day, and uh, yeah, we we're still, but we're gonna promote it. Yeah. Okay. Let's show your art. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I think it's playing on the screen now. I know we can't see it on the call, but I'm hoping those in the event can are, are viewing it. Um, Roya, I'd love to hear if you have any advice for um, young women who want to be artists and want to make this kind of politically um, uh, relevant art, this politically potent art, this activist art, what, what kind of advice would you give them to get started and to continue in their practice? And uh, how would you suggest that they not get discouraged or, or afraid? Um, I believe uh, when you have a, a kind of talent, can be said, or you have a voice or this opportunity to show people what's your feeling, or you also can, this, you can have a, this feeling from other friends or a, a, another person too, you have to show it. When you have a talent or voice or kind of uh, opportunity to show around the world what's going on in a one country or another country, you have to use that. We shouldn't just say, oh, I, I, I would like to be quiet. Um, I don't want to talk this. No, I said, as I said, this is a duty of art. We have to talk to our talent and our art and kind of inform people around the world is the only way, at least for me, I'm not like a good speaker. <laughs> I'm not like good uh, to talk loudly and use words. So I can show my feelings, but I am talking, I am thinking, or I am feeling about this situation through my paintings and through my brushes. So hopefully a lot of artists start doing that and uh, kind of, think about it, uh, how it can be helpful for a lot of people, like especially women in Iran. Maybe a lot of people that around the world doesn't know any, anything, I mean, what's going on or, yeah. you know, what the situation is in Iran. They can, I mean, they might see some news, but the strong things, a uh, strong way can we say to showing the feeling and uh, how, how it is, I mean, scary, is I think to the art, special like maybe art, I mean, painting and music. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us today, Roya, and for the gift of your art. Um, I will post in the chat information about where you where your art can be viewed, um, and I can't wait. Uh, Nancy had such wonderful things to say about the opening. I can't wait to go up and look at it in person myself. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. Um, and with that, it is my honor to introduce our next panelist. Mashid Mir studied medicine in Tehran after graduation and moved to the U.S. for her postdoc fellowship in cardiology at Harvard. Her residency training in internal medicine was at St. Joseph Hospital in Chicago. Mira is a healer in her day job and an activist in her volunteer time, finding the meaning of life and advocating for the right thing and devoting her life to improvement. Thank you so much, Mashid. Thank you so much, Mandy, for having us over here. And thank you everyone for joining us over here. It's my pleasure to have the honor to talk over here and let everyone know about what's going on. Um, I can start by giving some um, small background about what's going on because um, I was thinking it's a good idea for all of us to have an idea about what's happening uh, and why people are pissed in Iran. And it's not just about Iran, it's about the whole world that is having some humanitarian crisis and we're seeing it. But right now it's more pronounced in Iran. So that's why we have to focus over here in this one. Um, I believe that we as women have been uh, unfortunately repressed throughout generations. It's not a very new thing. The 
the repression to women has been historically over there and it's been more pronounced in Middle Eastern countries, unfortunately, um, with a lot of governments who are trying to repress females, we see that this movement has been ongoing in the Middle East. Uh, in Iran, the situation was not like this. Um, there were some improvements in women's, um, in women's activism and uh, in women's rights in Iran uh, before the Islamic Republic Revolution that happened in 1979. Um, after that revolution, which wasn't actually an Islamic Republic revolution by itself, it was a revolution for freedom. Uh, but um, for the matter of freedom, people of Iran who are basically like Islamic people, they decided to give their trust to Islamic figures and made the whole mistake of um, prior times of letting the theocracies and the religion to run the country. So that's what happened in 1979. Um, it's interesting that in 1979, after the revolution, they started to just put the order for forcing everyone to wear mandatory hijab. We think about mandatory hijab as it's like, it's nothing, you're just going to wear something. But it's not this easy. The first thing that they're forcing you to do, the next thing is going to happen after that. Uh, so if you don't resist anything that is being forced to you and just do, do it without knowing your own right, this is going to continue. And that happened, unfortunately, in Iran. After putting the order for mandatory hijab in 1979, um, Iranian women, I believe it was in March 1979, they had a protest. Over 100,000 women can, came out and they were trying to have their protest against wearing mandatory hijab. That time, a lot of activists over there didn't support these women who were protesting for their rights. And that was the starting point of Islamic Republic just forcing people to do what they want to do. Uh, since that day, I believe it's been um, right now more than 40 years that the repression and the amount of force that the governments are enforcing people to do is just increasing. Um, the way that women are getting repressed in Iran, they don't have any sort of rights, is going to cause families to have a repressed person, which is the mother of the family, growing the children. And a repressed woman is going to cause a repressed generation to kind of like being raised up and this repressed generation is not going to have enough voice to resist against or to fight for what are their own um, rights so they cannot do such a thing. Um, I was actually be, being raised by such a woman. My mother was, um, when the revolution happened, my mother was just 10 years old. She was forced to wear hijab and um, I remember the way that she was describing it to me. She was like, I was going to school. Everything was very fine. We didn't have any sort of mandatory things. We were having a lot of great activities in my, our elementary school. Then one day they said that you cannot enter the school unless you wear some sort of scarf. In one year, they changed the scarf that you have to wear also a scarf and men too, and also some sort of pants. After that, for getting into university, you couldn't get into university unless everyone in the neighborhood um, do some, they do some research on you. And if you're like literally all the time wearing this mandatory hijab and is like doing a good thing, that's the only way that you can enter university. So that was like at the start of the, revol the Islamic revolution. So I see oh, people who are thinking, who are having their choices, they're not having the choice to do whatever they want. They should behave outside in a specific manner that has been forced by the government in order to be able to get into an educational system and to an educational panel. Uh, that has been ongoing for a long time. And the start of the morality police has been something for the past almost, I would say, 15 or 20 years that I've been hearing about it as the morality police. Um, my mom, who was raised in that situation, rose me in a way that I wasn't able or I wasn't willing to, um, to fight against anything for myself. I remember I was doing medicine in medical school. I'm a medical doctor. I just want to study medicine. I want to come back home and focus on my medicine. But every time I was entering the university, there were people standing at the start of university to let you know that your hijab is not proper. You should not enter university because your hijab is not the way that you they want. And it's not about proper hijab because when we're talking about proper hijab, what is the proper hijab? Is it like wearing a burqa or is it like wearing some sort of like chador or is it just like wearing some sort of scarf? They had a specific requirements, as Roya was saying, you should not wear boots. Like, what, what is boots doing with hijab? It's just a boot. I'm just covering my leg. But that was something that it was, 
it was not accepted over there back then, back then. Um, regardless, I was one of those people that after being forced multiple times by multiple things, I decided to just get out of the country and to go to a free country so that I can be who I am and I can just like be myself. While a lot of people are still over there and what we're hearing right now, the protests that are going on, all these people who were repressed all these times are tired of being repressed and they just want to have their own rights, the right to study, the right to do whatever they want to do. Um, let me tell you a story about this one, about how much women's rights are kind of like suppressed in Iran at this moment. I was practicing in the rural areas of Iran, in the south, southern border of Iran, and um, there was a lady, she was pregnant with her 10th child. She was also working and her husband was um, just um, using opioids as a matter of fun. So this lady with 10th children, growing 10th children, was having the 10th pregnancy while the husband was not doing any job. And I asked her, I asked her, why are you pregnant for the 10th baby? Have you ever thought about contraception? She had hypertension, she had high blood pressure. Um, and literally, what happened? Oh no, Mashi, did we lose you? Oh, here you go. I can see it. I can see you and Mandy. I can't see your video machine. Okay. Do you see it now? Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry about it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this lady didn't have any choice. She was literally imprisoned in her situation to keep on giving birth to all these children without um having any rights to do it by herself like it literally if she was getting a divorce from her husband that's what i told her i was like if you divorce at least you're going to have one person less to feed because that that's the least thing that is going to happen but she didn't have the right to do such a thing and a country that is repressing people to this much the children that are going to be raised in the next generation are going to be also the repressed children that are going to continue on doing whatever the government is asking them to do if the government is asking them to go to an armed forces and try to do some terroristic activities they've been raised as repressed generation so they're going to continue on doing whatever the government is telling them because they don't have that much options to go anymore after that um so I think right now a lot of these children understand that this is not something that they want it to continue and that's why they're protesting for their rights because they don't have any other option at this point. And this is why every Iranian that is even outside United outside Iran at this point are kind of like feeling the same with them because they can understand how things could have gone if things doesn't change. Um, I want to just like take a moment over here and I want to talk about this fact that it's important for us, all of us to unite together about this one. It's not just about Iranians going through this or Iranian women being repressed like this. Um, I think a lot of these thinkings of these sort of governments is something like, it's kind of like a spreadable that repressed forces are going to spread their, themselves, the dictators are going to spread themselves. They're going to spread their forces. And this is kind of like going to change the whole world that we're living in it. So it's important for us all to unite together so that we can show that we don't want such a thing to be in our world at all. Because anyone being repressed is a, is, is a chance that we are going to be repressed one day too. If we're hearing about it, definitely there's something, there's a reason that we're hearing about something.
Thank you so much, Mashid. Um, if it's okay, I've, I'll let, go ahead and let Zora speak next, and then we'll do questions. And then also in, feel free again to be in conversation with each other. Um, so our next panelist is Dr. Zora Gavam Shahidi, and she's a retired Iranian American political scientist or political science professor who taught at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater, where she was the chair of the women's studies and anthropology departments, and taught courses in international relations and international law. A Fulbright scholar, she has written extensively about the intersections of gender and religious identities in the Middle East and in the diaspora and their relationships to state building and common stereotypes. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you to all the audience that I can see <laughs> for participating in this. Um, Roya and uh, Mahshid uh, covered um, a lot of points, but I'm going to get into three issues. One is Islamic Sharia. I'm sure everybody has this question that what's going on, you know, what are the rules? So Sharia is a set of laws, uh, regulations that are the interpretation of the holy book of Muslims called Quran, and also another collection of works called Hadith, which or tradition, which are Muhammad's saying and Muhammad's behaving when he had, Prophet Muhammad, when he had problems or he wanted to cons consult with people and so on and so forth. So Sharia law is interpretation by the theologist of these two sources, okay? But it became, pre uh, predominantly became the law in Muslim countries. Now, let's look at it. Uh, the Quran has everything necessary for treating women, one, two, three, four, very, very precisely explained. Um, uh, I'm going to jump into what they are quickly. One, of course, is the hijab or covering from here to your toes and in mostly in uh, unattractive colors. Okay, so you cannot show anything in your body that may attract you guys. And there is this obsession about this because they say that, uh, for example, if you show your hair, men are going to be aroused. And thus, um, women are the sources of what they call fetna or chaos. Okay, and they have a lot of saying like, Oh, somebody fell off the roof because they were looking at this woman who had beautiful face. <laughs> and so on. So, so women become the source of chaos. And uh, the, the marriage age is when the woman uh, reaches puberty, which for a lot of Arab women is actually about nine years old. Uh, and uh, so they, they set that as, as a threshold. And uh, divorce is not a right for women to divorce. And um, it's man, the man can just say, they don't even have to go to the court. They, they can say, I divorce you right here in their house. And then you are divorced. And also the child custody is according to Sharia. The kids, uh, up, the, the, the boys up to two years old, uh, are with the mother uh, and the girls up to seven years old are with the mother, but then they have to pass them on. If the father dies, then the woman cannot keep the children. The, the woman has to, the wife has to give them to grandparents or a guardian from the father's side. Okay, I know you are getting angry now, as I am. So, um, and uh, least, uh, last not least is the inheritance law that according to Islamic Sharia, a woman get half of whatever man gets. And then there is uh, 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 another law, which um, if you're a woman and you want to be a witness in the court, you're counted as half of a man. So you have to have two women to <laughs> come and tell you what's going on as, as a witness. There has been very harsh punishment throughout history against uh, outspoken women like Rashid and myself, <laughs> Arroyo, and uh, aren't you happy you're here? <laughs> um, the punishment, you know, uh, has been 
beating, imprisonment, and uh, um, actually public execution. Um, if you violate the Sharia laws, then you're in big trouble. Okay, and this. Uh, um, so this was just a very encapsulated, I would say, summary of Sharia law. Now, there has always, the, the Muslims actually came to Iran or took over Iran in 7th century AD. And I don't want to go back there, but um, uh, the women's movement in Iran is not a new phenomenon. I can go back at least to 1800s, where um, a couple of sisters uh, from a very prominent religious family are starting um, to challenge their father and the clergy about the demeaning position of woman, diminish, diminishing uh, position of woman. And unfortunately, they were executed in public. So I, I mean, if I want to tell you this, it's going to take a long period of time. So I'm jumping to another movement that was uh, strongly supported by women was the Constitutional Revolution in the, uh, 1907, from 1907 to 1911. The women actually were armed and fought the government, uh, along the government. So they were two, here you see two different kind of activism. One is what they call indigenous feminism or Muslim feminism, which is now prevalent in the other countries like Egypt and Morocco and Tunisia. Um, and then the other ones are secular feminists, which again, they're divided into two, three ideologies. One were pro-monarchies and they were the group that they really did serve uh, the Iranian society, Iranian women through the Shah's uh, regulations. And I explained that. And the other groups are on the left. So, um, uh, and the left of course are socialist and communist or Marxist-Leninist groups. Um, in 1979, all of the above got together. Women got together and actually participated massively in the revolution. And uh, um, everybody says, why? You know, because they had social freedom. And that's true. They did. I remember I was a child and I used to, not child, even teenager, and I used to wear mini skirt, <laughs> which was not, um, you know, uh, it was not prohibited. You could wear it, you know, you could wear whatever you want. Um, so um, let's see what changed uh, this situation. And uh, the, uh, let me just find from 1925 to 1979. Okay, there was secularization. And unfortunately, always the clerics have been really very strong impediment towards any movement that the woman had, and they demanded some freedoms. Okay, so it has been going up and down, up and down, up and down, depending on how the ruler of the country was approaching them, okay? So when, uh, before Pahlavi dynasty, the Shah that everybody probably knows in, that they, they, he came to exile in 1979, before this dynasty, the previous dynasty was really corrupt. They used to just sell one of the states in Iran to Russians and they go to France, have a good time. Their women, the royal, the royalty women were actually very, very organized and they had secret societies. Okay, so that was kind of a beginning of um, um, public appearance and so on, so forth by one. But they're still in hijab. Okay, they were still in hijab. Until um, uh, from 1925, as I said, the Pahlavi dynasty came to, uh, to power and Reza Shah. Um, uh, was adamant. He went to Turkey and talked to Ataturk, who was a reformist. And he's, uh, he, when he came back, he decided that, okay, we have to do some things about this woman. The first thing they did was mandatory education for women. So all of a sudden you have in 10 years or 15 years, she said 20 years, there were um, hundreds of schools open for women. And uh, then in, uh, uh, 1932, I think it was when 
when um, uh, the, sh the, the Shah and his uh, wife and, and kids, two girls, two lady girls, whatever, they went to the first graduation of women teachers college and they all were not in hijab. So that was, that was really a beginning of when the other educated woman is starting going abroad and, and also um, a whole bunch of colleges opened their door to women. And in this time, the very first thing that they did was, and I think uh, a lot of people say that Reza Shah made a mistake to, to do this uh, mandatory on hijabing people. That means the, the soldiers on the street, my grandmother said the soldiers would come with, with horses. And if you had chador on or, uh, you know, the veil on, they would pull it because they didn't want you to, to wear it anymore. And this, a lot of critics are saying that was a big mistake because it antagonized a lot of women who were traditionalists and they had to stay home as a result. Or if you were a little fancier, you would wear hats, like the European hats. And um, so that, that by itself was a problem. But he also uh, established a whole bunch of different things like, like changing the marriage law from, uh, uh, from puberty to 18, actually. And um, um, then, as I said, education for women, um, no hijab for women. Women start having rights to uh, form a lot of association and organizations. And uh, after that, Reza Shah was gone. Reza Shah was gone and his son came and he was a little bit more le lenient. Uh, I'm a PhD student receiving, okay, I couldn't read the, the message that was sent to me. It was too fast. Um, uh, when the, uh, Muhammad Reza Shah came, the first thing they did was um, family protection law, which was really, really important. And this was not done just out of the blue. Uh, a lot of women, secularist women, um, fought for this. And the, the, the first thing was to change the marriage, again, you know, the marriage age, the issue about divorce. The divorce now goes to the court. Instead of men say, oh, you're divorced, you know. They had to go to court and the uh, judge would decide about the, ch the children's um, custody. And uh, what else, Mashi? Do you remember about family protection law? Do you remember anything? No? Okay, it's okay. So, so um, um, this, this was a very big accomplishment for, for women. And um, as I said, the first one was really hijab. But little by little, you know, Iranian women became very educated, very educated. In, for example, in um, um, 1979, um, uh, there were at least three, 30 percent, one third of the students at the universities were women. And now are over, over 55 percent of women are in uh, <clears throat> in the universities, and uh, you see two of them right now are the <laughs> result of those reforms. Um, I don't. How much time do you have? Like five more minutes to go through what's going down? Yeah, time. Go for it. Okay. Um, the um, 1979 revolution happened, and the first decree that Ayatollah Khomeini did was compulsory hijab, okay? And thus, there were a formation, the beginning of the formation of the morality police. Uh, they weren't there yet. They came in 1981. And uh, uh, women uh, reacted in, as, I, as you said, March 8, 1979, they started demonstration. It was Women's, International Women's Day. And then they had another conference of unity of women in December of 1979 that antagonized the calorics more and more. So this is when uh, they, they, they just got rid of family protection law. Again, it went back to the traditional Sharia. However, in course of time, you had a couple of reformist presidents like Khatami that really was a hope for people. 
uh, especially for women, that he reinstated some of the um, family protection laws, but, you know, in a much milder way. Uh, but I want to make sure that you understand that all of these laws, the judge take it personally. You know, it doesn't matter what the law is. He looks at you and he says, oh, no, you look bad. You don't look too Islamic, so the child goes to the father. Or, you know, this type of reforms. So the Iranian woman, younger woman in the um, uh, 90s, when they voted for Khatami, they were hoping for really dynamic, uh, diametric reforms, which didn't happen. And uh, every time a president came, depending on who supports them, either hardliner on the right or the centrist, things changed slightly. And uh, uh, this last one, Raisi, is, I guess is the worst one because um, of all these things that have been created. <clears throat> um, the, uh, during, from, in 90s, the woman failed a little bit in terms of politics, so you had some representation in the parliament. And uh, I must say, I must say that the, even the Muslim feminists, they had a really, really hard time to or start their organization. But they did. They, they got together uh, with the secular woman. They created organization and they had a number of magazines, women magazines were published. And uh, that was a major uh, accomplishment, but not enough for social uh, freedom uh, and human rights. Uh, because all those activists got to go to jail, by the way, and their <laughs> newspapers were shut down and uh, they went to jail. They are serving as we speak. And I think one of them is going to be free now, but then they, they come out of the jail and then they, were, they, they are going to be re-jailed again for other convictions. I don't know how it works. I really don't get it. I, I haven't seen any laws, <laughs> body of laws that does that. Anyways, as I said, I don't want to take too much time. Um, so some things happened, some good things happened, and by Raisi, again, the, the Muslim um, morality police came back, and uh, as you know, they arrested this, this, this present, present movement of women um, is completely different from the past, because they no longer trust the government. They no longer believe that government has the ability to actually uh, in, uh, create any type of reforms. They know that hijab law is not going to change. They, they are aware. They are very politically aware. And they know uh, that this regime uh, is not going to change. It's interesting because first it was about hijab and some, some rights within the context of this government. But now they want the overthrow of this regime. This is a big shift, sociological shift, that now they want to get rid of the regime. Uh, if I may, I have a few points about the specificity of this uh, movement, if I have time. And uh, quickly I'll go through them. And uh, then I, if we have time, I talk about the reaction of international community, especially the United States. This move, the present movement is not centralized. However, widespread spread, spread in the in, in Iran, and uh, which is very interesting because they learn how to get together. They have what they call um, square leadership uh, or rahbar meydani, which means one group of people get together, do some demonstration. They don't do it next day in the same place because of the security forces come there. So they trick them. They go to another place. So it's, uh, it's not centralized. And um, uh, the demand is very clear. It's social political freedom, change, changing compulsory hijab freedom of speech and public, publication association, generally human rights that for everybody, not just for women. Uh, the, uh, and as you know, it has started out with uh, the murderous, um, uh, you know, killing of Mahsa Amini, a Kurdish young 22 years old woman, 
dad was arrested and beaten and raped. And three days later, she died in the hospital. And the family could not tell any. They told the family, you have to say that she was ill. She died from heart attack. And the coroner office could not say anything about the, um, you know, they struck her many times on her head. So that's how the people are start reacting. And um, uh, one good point again is that in this movement, if you see, it's not like just taking your hijab out. There are a lot of women in hijab that you're protesting against the government. So that's really good because there is a unity among them. And the government can't say anything because they were saying that you just want to take off your clothes. That's your problem. You just want to take off your clothes. And then it would, it would tell the Muslim woman that these people who are on the street, they are not Muslims, they burn the holy book of Islam, and da 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 But because women are respecting each other, no matter what attire they have, then the government has to shut up. Uh, the opposition, as you know now, is wide, widespread, and I'm not going through a um, whole bunch of different things. I had 11 points, but never mind that. <clears throat> now, the foreigner, I mean, I mean, the us foreigner in different countries uh, also are contributing immensely to this women's and, and general movement. As you know, in all the major cities in the world, uh, Berlin, uh, London, uh, New York, Chicago, Washington, D.C., um, so on and so forth, in Sweden and in Norway, and uh, Scandinavian country, basically, and in France, they have been demonstrating and uh, supporting Ir um, Iranian revolution. So um, that is a really, it's not unique because this 1979 had very strong support from students abroad as well. So um, another point is that Iranians know that the regime is shaking. Uh, Khamenei is 83 years old, and he doesn't have it. You know, he doesn't have that strength he had during the Green Revolution 13 years younger, when he was 13 years younger. So um, um, another point is, it's not just socio-political freedom, but also a collapsed economy in Iran. Every day there is a problem. When the Shah left, every dollar equaled seven to one. Are you guys with me? Seven to one. Now is 38,000 to one. One dollar is 38,000 to one. And the people, when they get paid, they can't even afford to buy food. It's incredible. It's incredible. The people are becoming poorer as we speak. Okay, I jump into the international support, as you know, on the 14th of December, yay, United Nations Socioeconomic Council, um, the Commission of the Status of Women, um, in there uh, was called um, for, uh, for, uh, for, to, expel, to expel the Iranians, and they did, which was really good, because they had uh, 29 uh, for the expel, of Iranians, eight against and 16 abstention. I, I'd like to tell you who are they against. Venezuela, Oman, Russia, China, Pakistan, Syria, Nicaragua. Um, all, you know, the countries that have problems also with the United States. So this, this was initiated by the UN, US ambassador in the Uni United Nations, Linda Greenfield. I guess a lot of you know her. Uh, she's a very activist, good activist um, person, woman. And uh, then the other thing is the United, uh, United Kingdom Parliament has urged the government to establish a specific resettlement route for Iranian women to allow them to seek refugee in UK, especially the one on the death row, by the way. Uh, so far, there has been eight, over 18,000 arrests. 18, uh, from 18,000 arrests, so far they said 493 are on death row. These are from age of 13 to one of them is 75. Um, uh, so as, as, and, uh, as you know, two 
two young men were were executed just recently in the last three four days or last last week and uh, um, the parliament also in Sweden and in um, Norway and Germany they all said that we are willing the individual parliamentarian they are willing to have political sponsorship for the death row people uh, in Iran. Now, all of the above, good, good, but I don't know how Iranian government is going to react. They probably are going to say, no, it's a conspiracy. Uh, they are saying it's a conspiracy by United States, European, and Israel, purposely, to, to destroy uh, Islam and dis destroy Islamic Republic. Um, United States is not moving that fast uh, because their priority is Ukraine. They are uh, unhappy why Iran is selling weapons, including um, drones, to Ukraine. The second point is the nuclear issue. They had to. They want to go back to the to the table and talk about it and try not to try to prevent Iran from building a bomb. And also the support of terrorism all over the by the regime. And last but not least is violation of human rights, which includes this uh, you know movement. I'm gonna stop. I'm sorry. So, so I'm gonna stop maybe you know I can answer some questions. I couldn't read the the messages. They came really fast and gone. So for sure. Um, some of the questions you covered uh, a lot in your in your talk already, so that's great. But I wanted to get one before we get too far into the discussion. Um, it's from a PhD student who's researching Iranian women in education. Um, and they want to know if you can tell them the names of the two sisters who stood up to their father and were yeah. executed. Yeah, um, I can tell that. The fr uh, one was Fatima and the sister was Marzia. Uh, Marzi, do you want me to spell it? Marzia, M A M A R M A R Z I E H. Marzia, and they were actually from a very prominent um, religious family, and um, uh, but they wanted to to reform from within Islam. And what happened? They actually uh, were exiled a couple of times by the clergy, and then um, uh, the other name for the Fatima became Oratul Ain. Tahira means pure, Oratul Ain, the eyes of uh, the eyes of the movement. And she uh, she was exiled again, but she came back and at the time there was a big um, movement in Iran, religious movement called Bobbies, uh, that they gave a lot of rights to women and then it became Baha'i later. And uh, she became very active with her sister, but then the theocracy was really angry, the, the uh, uh, clerics were angry, and she was executed along with a lot of Bobby women and children. It shook the nation, particularly the upper class and more educated women. So I don't know if I answered the PhD student question, but she is welcome to email me if she wants. And I can, I can give her some resources. Great. Do you have their last name, the sister's last name? Oh, it's, unfortunately, back then they didn't have last name. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and uh, uh, another person who maybe she wants to look into um, is uh, the Taj Sartane, which was the daughter of the Shah at the time, and she was also very, very active in. Um, uh, trying to uh, change the system that she said she criticized a stagnation of political and social institutions in Iran without, without rejecting monarchy, criticized hijab and its role in stopping women from advancing and joined secret societies, created secret societies. So unfortunately, they didn't have a last name. So I don't know. They, they were just, people were called by their father's name. Okay, but I could help her out on that and give her more information if she would like to 
um, give her access to my uh, email. Okay, maybe we can connect after after the panel. Sure. Uh, Mali, if you don't mind, I, I want to ask a question from Zohar John. Um, Zohar John, I have this question. We talked a lot about women's and how women's rights have been um, repressed by Islamic Republic at this time. Can we also, can you also update us about how the men's right has been repressed by the IR government? Well, of course, of course. However, unfortunately, men in Iran um, have this tendency to accept misogyny, <laughs> misogynistic ideology. I mean, I guess everybody in the world kind of like to be in power, right? I don't mean all the men in the world, but uh, it has been also very suppressive to young men. If you look at the pictures of people who were executed, um, who were shot, these 430, uh, 493 people that they were shot in this recent demonstration, they're all so handsome and, you know, childish looking, beautiful uh, from everywhere. So they, they shoot them in the face with shotgun and also BB guns, especially the boys who are models, uh, to make him look ugly. Anyways, they are dead now, but um, um, uh, men, are, the, the progressive men, and highly educated men, are not very happy with this regime either, and you can see that they support women. They say, Zanzendegi Aizagi, woman life freedom. So they're still saying Zanzendegi Aizagi. There are always some opportunistic people who jump in and say, well, this is also men's movement. I don't want to say it is not. Um, of course, we so, the men are supporting the movement and we need their support anyways. But the tendency of misogyny is unfortunately um, very easy to slip in. So, uh, I mean, my own brother, <laughs> I shouldn't say that, but a lot of people say, why does she have to have a PhD and is spending our father's money? Instead of saying, well, we are proud of this PhD woman or doctor woman like you, Mahshijan. And um, uh, yeah, so did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a question for both of you. Um, I know there are some activists here in the abortion rights movement in the U.S. who are frustrated because with the fall of Roe, we have not seen the kind of sustained protests that have been happening throughout Iran, um, even though this is a massive setback for our rights. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the breadth of geographic support for the protests in Iran and what this means to previous year's protests, and specifically, um, if you talk a little bit about the labor groups who have also joined in these protests. Um, uh, one of our viewers heard that the oil workers and others have organized strikes. Can you talk a little bit more about how different sectors of the population are coming together? Yes, actually, as I said, it's not a centralized, uh, you know, it's not a centralized movement. Mashija, did you want to talk about it? Mashija? Yes? I I'm going to take some updates regarding the protests that we're going to organize afterward, after you're finished. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say it's not centralized. But and they, it's very spontaneous. It was unlike 1979 that you had a whole bunch of underground, you know, uh, parties, um, you know, Marxist Leninist parties, Mujahideen al as a as a group, and also the two day party, which was supported by Soviet Union back then. This one is really not centralized, but it's widespread, which is amazing you know, which is really amazing. It's very spontaneous and people just go and without any fear. Now, as far as the workers uh, are concerned, the, uh, the steel industry, the steel industry workers actually were the first group that they were on, this, on a strike during this uh, uprising. And the oil, some oil, oil workers, and I'm telling you, if the oil workers go on a strike, shit is going to hit the fan for the entire government because they, they can't have any money, you know. And then the, the truckers, the truckers all over Iran, the bus drivers, um, they are on a strike too. Now, the people are saying for 10 minutes, 
at night, turn off all the lights in Tehran or in the big cities. If you turn on the lights, it damages a whole bunch of things, evidently, technologically. And they're saying that take your money out of the banks. This way, you are damaging the economy furthermore and actually paralyzing the government. And uh, what else? A lot of kids don't go to school. A lot of, a, a lot of um, students are on a hunger strike. And um, by the way, another, on another note, what they did in two very uh, famous universities in Tehran that they were industry uh, sanat and uh, I can I think it's called industry. Um, they poisoned 150 students with the food, unbelievable. And then they they all went to the hospital. Two different universities. Is it like a coincidence or? Mr. Putin is helping them on poisoning people because he's an expert. And um, another note is some of these kids, when they are free from jail, two days later they die. The rumor is that they put poison in their food two, three days in advance before they free them. So, uh, and it appears like they take pills to kill themselves. It's your, your floor, go ahead. It's, it's so sad about everything that you're saying, Zohar John, when I'm hearing about it, like um, if anyone is following the news of Iran, when they're seeing all the executions, like whoever they're killing in the streets without having, even the armed forces that are attacking people who are protesting are not wearing armed, um, you, armed clothes. So they're kind of like, you see people that are um, wearing normally and carrying some guns, moving together as a pack and attacking people mm. and um people are asking what's going on they're arresting the rest of them and executing them in jails the what? jails are um kind of like very crowded i think so far if i'm right zohar john is i think about 15 to 17 thousand activists and protesters are uh, imprisoned yeah and okay. Not having enough space for 15, 17,000. These people are supposed to eat. They're supposed to have like a humanitarian condition to be detained, even if they're going to be detained, for, for which there's no reason for them to be detained. Protest is not a reason for uh, arresting people. Yeah. Not only they've been arrested, they're not being kept in a high, in, in a good situation. They've been having tortured. We've seen all these videos that they're putting on their channels, like literally without being even ashamed of that. They show the faces of these people having all these bruises and everything else. And then they execute them in public in front of all the people who are already protesting for just like showing that they can do whatever they want to do. And the people are un unarmed. People do not have armed weapons. Right. This is not a violent revolution. No, not so at all. This is not... Yeah, this is not a guerrilla movement. This is not a civil war. Although the government is trying to infiltrate and arm some people, they shoot back to the volunteer groups. The volunteers are the ones who are shooting in forefront so that they can say, ah, these are violent people and we should ta 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 kill all of them. You see? Yeah, that they are infiltrating, infiltrating everywhere. They don't even let the parents to go to the cemetery to see the the the, the young man who died. Just uh, the second person who was murdered, uh, hanged. Uh, the government called the mother and said, "Oh, your son is executed and is buried in such and such plot in such and such cemetery." And then the, the, only the family member, 10 of them could go. There were 10 family members, about 30 police, policemen there uh, on their motorcycle and their helmets and all that jazz. So That's actually a very valid point, Zohrejan, because these days, Iranian governments, um, the Islamic Republic government, I would say, not right. arrest, kill people in the streets, arrest people. They do not let them to get the people who are getting wounded. They do not let them to get medical treatment exactly. as appropriate as it is. They just like people who are wounded, they take them to prisons without letting them to have 
um, enough medical um, supplies to just like get treated. And when they're dying, they ask the families to pay them to just hand over the body of their children to them. Right. Yeah. And they're even selling, not only selling the bodies of the people to their own families, but also they're selling the Mirtier um, title. So they say that, for example, if because a lot of people in Iran have religious beliefs, uh, so they 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 just involve in religious activities out of their own belief. It's not in support of governments. Like for example, Arbain or Ashura Taswa are kind of like very big ceremonies in Iran. If someone is going to any of these um, religious cultural activities, they're gonna try to sell them the the title of Mirtier, and they're gonna say that these people are dead on government's behalf. They weren't protesting. They were actually from government side, which families are trying to also say that, hey, our children were not with government. They were protesting against the government. Why the government is trying to say that this was a soldier of ours? Yeah, on that note, most of the people who go to court, their, uh, their conviction takes place uh, in uh, less than 10, 20 days. And uh, they have appointed lawyers the judge actually appoints a lawyer for them. And the lawyers are not accessible because if you are arrested, your family has three days to call an object through the lawyer. The lawyers don't answer the phone. Yeah, you're just... You're it's right. amazing. It's, I mean, uh, I have to say, this is really well-skilled um, forces of suppression. So uh, that is like yeah i just read a question by nancy mandy if you don't mind i'm gonna just answer that question um and thanks so much for asking that question nancy um we believe that the more aware people in the whole world are about what's a humanitarian crisis that is going on in iran is going to make the government more responsible because at the end of the day the economies are entangled together iranian governments are getting a lot of money throughout um, selling oil and everything else. So the more they're under pressure by um, international governments, the more the chances are for um, less humanitarian crisis. They're organizing um, a lot of like protests in different cities in United States. Um, the thing is because these sort of things started happening very rapidly and in Iran there were, because of the repressive forces of government, there were not enough unions and unities to be made for people to gather together. We're just starting to make all these unions that we can keep in touch and we can spread the message and we can just uh, work in unity with each other to show our objection about what's going on. One of the groups that started emerging over here in Chicago, it's called Chicago for Iran. Uh, so if you search in Instagram, you can find them easily. Uh, it's Chicago and number four and Iran. Uh, there are a bunch of activists from students like me who are just working after, after seeing what happened in Iran. They tried to see how they can organize these protests so that every Iranian who also have the same objection, they can join together. And the goal is not for leading something. It's just more about gathering together for showing the same message that we're having. Um, we had a bunch of protests that had been organized before, but there's going to be one protest this um, Saturday at noontime um, that we are wondering if whoever also thinks the same, that we have to show our objection about the humanitarian crisis that is going on in Iran. We're just going to um, start to do a protest and to show our solidarity with what's going on in Iran and our objection over there. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Mashid. And I think um, Haymarket was going to post the graphic for, for that action on Saturday in the chat. I encourage all of us in Chicago, uh, if you can, to uh, come out in solidarity on Saturday. Um, Zara, do you have anything to add to what uh, people in the U.S. can do to show their solidarity with protesters in Iran, their solidarity with protesters in Iran? When this is started, I actually wrote to Pamela Harris. Um, I thought she should take a position on that. Uh, and, uh, you know, prominent women like Michelle Obama, um, even Laura Bush, <laughs> I'm sure you like her. Um, she's for education. So, um, and also, um, 
Jill Biden and uh, a whole bunch of other prominent women did say and some things and supported Iran. But I I think U.S. is in a really tough situation. It's like uh, almost uh, the human rights is almost like a hostage by Iranian government because they said we are not coming back on the nuclear talk. The Iranians are saying, and Americans know that in three different unrecognized locations, there are traces of uranium. That means bad, I guess. So um, I, I think that the best way is to write to our representatives and the senators um, and uh, express our solidarity and ask them for more and more sanctions on individuals, individuals who are involved with this whole thing, with this whole suppression of people. And uh, as you know, um, the first one who actually put sanction on the financial situation was uh, Justin Trudeau in Canada. Um, almost after one month, uh, he came out and he said, there's going to be investigation of how these people came to Canada and brought so much money. And, uh, you know, they are trying to curtail that. And he said that there is no more visas for Revolutionary Guard or people who work for the government. And uh, by now it's too late because the, the kids of these people are in the U.S. They are all citizens, you know. They're all established. They're doctors, engineers, or whatever. They're living a very good life in, in you know, semi-mansion places, in nice places that everybody else likes to be. So um, I think that the, um, the white, really the State Department has to think about the issuing visa to these kids. I mean, do a little bit more reading about who is coming, you know. Who is coming for what, you know, and um, uh, also writing letters to the representatives to put pressure on international community um, to, uh, uh, you know, condemn the behavior. And I don't know what else they can do because I'm not a, I'm not for any type of war. I don't want. What Bush said, Bush said he's going to liberate women in Iraq and liberate women in, in Afghanistan. That's not the way. Uh -uh -uh. Because what, Iranian women don't need that. You know, Iranian revolutionaries, which is not a popular movement, they don't really need that. They don't need the war. They don't need to destroy the infrastructure and build it all over again, you know. So at this point, I should say what it's holding the future is there are two ways. One is radical changes. If this regime wants to stay, there has to be radical changes in uh, all sorts of things, like social freedom, political participation of women more to be elected and take participation in, in uh, political processes. Um, uh, do economic reforms, uh, corruption is really rampant, start fighting corruptions of the official government officials. And, uh, um, you know, big reforms, I would say, uh, dynamic uh, reforms. Or step down, that's the only two. Which I don't think the second one is gonna happen anytime soon. You know, because these people are going to hold on to their power. That's a good income, man, to be in power there. You know, you're talking about billions of dollars transferred to the bank account abroad, you know. And I must say that uh, Canada was the worst place in terms of accepting these people. But thank God to, I mean, thank the universe for... Um, the demonstration in Toronto and pushing uh, Justin Trudeau to come out and say no more. Did I answer your question, Mandy? 
I was like, Mashid, if you had something you wanted to add, go ahead. I was just going to ask one question from Zohra because uh, you're um, actually you're educated in this manner and I believe you know the best on how things can work, uh, what are the potentials. Uh, there are some, um, some talks that maybe the opposition parties outside Iran are supposed to unite together and make a unity that is accepted by Iranians. And these sort of unities are like the talks are started. Uh, that these sort of unities are going to happen. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, on how like countries like United States can behave regarding these sort of like unities if that happens, or if there's anything that we can request from other governments to help us for facilitating such a thing so that we can have... Yeah, that's absolutely great. Because there are almost four different oppositions there are two of our leaderships are women. One is Amasi Ali Nejad, the other one is Nazanin. And then the other two is one of the guys who is in Canada, his daughter and his wife uh, died in the explosion of a plane that was going to Ukraine and the Revolutionary Guard actually hit that with the missile. So he's an activist and he has his own followers. And then it's the Shah's son Reza, who I, actually he came out and he said that he doesn't want to become a monarch. He he just wants to go to Iran and help establish referendums for this and that. So uh, uh, there, uh, yeah, I think there should be a organized forum for them. And there, there are some, by the way. I've seen it. I've seen Nazanin and. Uh, uh, Esmailion, the, the fellow who lost his kids um, in the plane crash, uh, they together had uh, a, a talk in Canada and then Ali Nejad, Mahsa, Mahsa, uh, Mahsa. Uh, Issam Ali Nejad also um, has been uh, talking to them. So I agree there. But remember that there is one very religious group called Mujahideen Khan that they are really trying very hard. And U.S. helped them, actually. U.S. gave them a lot of money um, to be opposing Iranian government. They are very Muslim, too. But I guess a little bit um, opener than the traditional uh, Muslims. So um, they also are trying to hijack, hijack this thing, the movement. You know, so... I personally am not their fan. Yeah, I believe a lot of people are on the same boat with you. Yeah. A lot of people do not think that Mujahideen Khalq is a representative of Iranian people. Yeah. Um, more of their own group that they're trying to do something and they're trying to hijack things. At least they're not on the same dispora with everyone else. The 1979 revolution was also hijacked by Ayatollah Khomeini. There was no centralized place, but there were different groups that they organized. So all of the left said, don't say anything right now. Don't say anything right now. We have to be uh, united. We have to be united. That's why people today are very cautious about this. They are afraid that, oh, if we unite with Reza, what's going to happen? If we unite with two women, what's going to happen? You know what I mean? It's like they are really afraid of unities uh, that there are some infiltration of different groups that they are not wanted, you know? Like NIAC, North, uh, this is, uh, NIAC is National Iranian American Council, which is a lobbyist for Iranian government. And they have been actually, um, and dismissing a lot of this, uh, a lot of news on social media as propaganda. And they're just saying that, uh, well, two people got killed, you know? Well, you know? And they are the only people which are in direct communication with the American government, unfortunately. So one of the things Nancy asked, what can you do? that they can do is write that and say this North uh, um, uh, Iranian American, National Iranian American Council, NAYAK. Don't listen to them. They're really 
uh, yes, they are scholars, they are activists, and da 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 da. They are really fancy looking people too. Um, but this is uh, again a lobby for for Iranian government. They made it actually possible for nuclear talk to go ahead. Um, I want to just tell my say my own opinion about Nayak. I believe um, all these political organizations they are being created when the necessity for them starts mm -hmm. and they might change the direction of their thoughts. I've been talking and reading about what's going on about Nayak or other organizations. A lot of them once upon a time what it was with reformist party, which basically means they were supporting some reforms happening within the governments and they had hopes that reforms are going to help with the Islamic Republic having a better um, course of action or a more humanitarian action. But with this current protest, it seems like even Nayak thinks that you know, the Iranian governments are supposed to completely go, like the revolution is necessary. Because it seems like a lot of different parties, even the reformist parties within the Iran, more and more every day people are changing the direction of their thoughts. and They're becoming revolutionary too. You know, I don't trust them, though. They hijack you things, you know, I, I mean, I'm older and I've seen it. I'm not saying believe me, I'm just saying they hijack the, hijack the movements, you know, kind of like some of our politicians in the United States, that they vote against a bill, but when the bill passes, they go back and say, I signed this, you know, I did that. That's the truth from the South. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a threat that always exists whenever we're talking about any sort right. of power it's just coming up. Opportunistic. I don't know. It's, um, I mean, I appear, it might appear a little bit angry and all that jazz, and I am angry. I, I really have no sleep at night. Um, when I look at the pictures of those kids who have been uh, murdered and, um, very sad um and i'm not going not going to say the movement should take this direction or that direction i'm here i live here all i can do is just pass on some information you know go to a march write a letter and uh, i cannot tell them what to do or who to choose you know and of course there has to be a referendum you know what the government said they said only 3% of Iranians want referendum. Thus, it's not worth it. I'm always wondering if we can have a, a, a very nonviolent protest day in support of having a referendum and see how many people are going to literally come out in support of referendum. Because that's going to show literally what's going to happen. But I don't think government of Iran ever, never, ever, let us to have a non-violent it's, it's, it's not in their advantage right now. You know? I, I am so sorry that we're nearing the end of our time together and I'm so sad because this discussion is, is getting really, really, really great. Um, we have just about three minutes left, but I wonder uh, what places you would direct people who want to keep you know, abreast of what's happening, what news sources, uh, what accounts you think they should follow um, to continue to be informed? First, I really want people, American people, to write some letters to CNN, MSNBC, uh, News Nation, that touch upon this news. Nobody knows what's going on in the U.S. In my own building, people who are walking around, they don't even know where the hell is Iran, you know? It's, it's really a shame that 1979, it was a daily phenomenon. I remember some of, the, some of these people built their career on Iranian revolution. I remember Peter Jennings was one of them. And uh, you weren't born probably back then. So um, uh, they should really write letters to, to this uh, organization, news organization, to cover these stories, to um, uh, make people aware. And also, as I said, the... The direction is I would like to American sisters and brothers to participate in the marches and, uh, you know, continue your struggle. I'm with you with the issue of abortion. 
I also would like to say the same thing that Zohar Jan said. I am totally with you regarding the abortion rights because abortion rights are women's rights and we're talking about humanitarian rights within any part of the world. I think we're supposed to have these sort of rights for everyone. And it's very sad to see what's going on in the United States with abortion rights. I've been hearing stories from other states that uh, medical professionals have problem with even doing medical abortion, which is very necessary. There's one part of elective abortion and there's another part for medical abortion. And when you're putting all these sort of laws, you're making a medical access thing completely out of the hand of people who really need that and their life is like literally based on that. Um, it doesn't matter if it's the United States that is a free country or if it's Iran that is like too much repressed. These rights should, should exist for everyone. We're fighting for the same thing. We're fighting for the rights to be there for us, for all of us, so that we can, we can choose. We can be free of our, our choices. Thank you so much, Mashid and Zora. I think this is a wonderful place to end our discussion. Thank you for the solidarity. And I hope everyone will come out on Saturday um, to show their own solidarity. Um, thank you both. And thanks to Haymarket. Thank you. Thank you so much for hosting us.